Kevin was right. As we get to, to, to Easter, it's, it's easy to run into that excitement. But if we back up, Holy Week has been taking us to this moment. It was, it was Sunday when Jesus rode into town on the donkey and everyone cried out, Hosanna. It was Monday when he, he went back into town again, but this time it was for, he was received differently and he ran the money changers out of the temple. Tuesday, he debated with the religious leaders as they were making up their minds that this was the time for him to go. Wednesday is when they made their deal with Judas. Thursday, Thursday is when he washed feet. Thursdays when he instituted the Lord's Supper. Thursdays in the Garden of Gethsemane. Friday, just after midnight, most likely, he was arrested, led through a series of illegal and ridiculous trials. By noon, he was on a cross. By three in the afternoon, Jesus was dead. There was a Swiss theologian that that, that captured it, I think, well in, in this way. He said, immeasurable emptiness, not solitude, streams forth from the hanging body. There is nothing more than nothingness itself, the witness declares. The world is dead. Love is dead. God is dead. The scene is dark, hopeless, and empty. There is no sign of life in the place of death. Saturday, then is a, just a day of quiet discouragement. But Sunday was different. This morning, we're going to step into Sunday. We've got four chairs, four people, and four perspectives. Four chairs, four people who encounter Jesus on Easter. Well, one of them's Jesus, so. Four perspectives. The first one, Be Mary Magdalene, Mary from the town of Magdala. The amount of hurt and trauma that Mary has experienced is is more than most will ever know. Honestly, it's staggering. Now, uh, for some reason, it got out that, that she is the woman who was caught in adultery or that she was a prostitute. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. Uh, Mary uh, comes from a very wealthy town, but her hurt lingered at a depth that most will never understand. She literally dealt with demons. Literally. And Jesus was the only one that was able to make them go away. But now he's dead. Buried. Her help, her Savior was gone. What in the world does the future hold for her at this point? Would she be accepted? And then there's Peter. Peter is a very close friend of Jesus and one of the earliest leaders in this movement that Jesus was starting. But the last time that Jesus looked Peter in the eyes, Peter was cussing out a servant girl and saying, I don't know him. The last time they made eye contact, had to be the lowest point of his life. That's not how you want to go out. Judas wasn't the only turncoat that night. But we know it's easy to fail when the pressure's on, when you're afraid, and when you think you're alone. And that's what happened to Peter. Three times he denied knowing Jesus when asked. Three times he said, I don't know him, and words are like bullets. Once they've been sent down range, you can't get them back. And then there's John, Mary, Peter, John. John is most likely Jesus' very best friend. He's the only one that went to the cross of the twelve. He refers to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Like Peter, he had, he had left his trade just to follow Jesus with his undivided attention. So his best friend has just been killed in about the most graphic way that one can imagine. 
Heartbreak is real. And then there's Jesus, the object of the Father's love. Oh, Jesus had kept saying, my time's not come. Not quite yet, but now it had. This was the reason why he came. The Bible says this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, so he sent his son. And again, the Romans were like artists when it came to killing someone. And that's what happened to Jesus. He claimed to be the Messiah, but in, in, in their world, in the way that they expected a Messiah, a dead Messiah is like someone saying someone's short for a tall guy. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. The idea of a dead Messiah is nonsensical. Mary, Peter, John, Jesus, four chairs, four perspectives, four people, if you have a Bible, would you open it to John chapter 20? Um, we've been giving out uh, study Bibles. If, if you don't have one, there's, there's some over here, and if there, we run out there, I can get you more, I promise. Um, we try to give everyone a Bible. They're great to uh, study along with, and, and so we're all in the, the same translation as well. John chapter 20. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, remember that's John, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. It was early Sunday morning when Mary went to the tomb. Now, Mary's not alone. We know this from the other gospel writers. She's not the only gal that heads to the tomb. But John wants us to focus here. He's drawing our attention. We need to see what happens with Mary. He invites us to zoom in here for a moment. She's there to, to mourn. And, of course, they have to finish what the fellow started and. Gals, you can give me a preach here in a second. If, if you give a guy something to do, they're like, no, we've got to go and make sure it's done right now. So they had their early Sunday morning. And much to her surprise, the stone that was put in front of the tomb had been moved. And now that's no easy task. Actually, I even wonder how, how did they expect that it was going to be moved? Uh, we have a picture of a first century Jewish tomb. Now, in the ones when I was a kid that you put on a flannel graph, if anybody's old enough to remember those, like the rock was about yay tall. Um, that rock's about this tall. But a rock about this tall and about this wide, it's pretty heavy. And so what they would do is they would cut into a hillside. This one you can see the, um, just outside of Galilee, they were digging a road and they opened this one up. Uh, you see how there's an opening to the side. You would open it up, and then inside there would be fingers. If you'd show the next picture, there would be fingers in there, so that'd be a family tomb. So once a body was buried, then you could move it into the different areas, and then as nature took its course, they would gather the bones up, and they put them in a, in a bone box. So families would use these, these tombs. Now, Mary doesn't investigate. Uh, she doesn't need to. She sees that the stone is moved, and she takes off. It's obvious that someone has stole the body. I mean, what, what else? What more could they do to Jesus? The last thing she expected to find was evidence of a resurrection. Oh, they believed in an end-time resurrection. We know that there will be a resurrection at the end, but no one expected this right now. And the idea, again, of a dead and resurrected Messiah really was nonsense. So she runs to tell Peter and John. Look at verse 3. At that, Peter and the other disciples went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but didn't go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the, the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but it was folded up in a separate place by itself. 
The other disciple who had reached the tomb first then also went in, saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Did you notice that John draws attention twice to the fact that he outran Peter? (laughs) Uh, Peter's name may be Rock. He runs like a rock. John's like, yeah, I outran him. I got there first. And when he got there, he didn't go in, though, because that would be really indecent. He would have been unclean. You don't do that sort of thing. And whenever you read this text, notice there's saw, seen, there's a bunch of those type of words. And in the original language, oddly, they're all very different. The verb here is that John runs over and he bends over and like glances in. He's like, oh, glances in. He doesn't get a good look, but not Peter. Peter's Peter, right? He's been called the apostle with a foot-shaped mouth. So he's the one that, now think, that this is about this high. So for Peter to run and get in, what's he got to do? He's got to get down on the ground like this and crawl in, and there's not a light switch on the wall, so he's got a torch in there looking around, investigating in the fingers. That's what this had to have looked like. And it says, he saw, the word there is where we get theorized from. He gets down on his knees with a torch, and he's digging around in there. And he starts to put things together. And then finally, John crawls in as well. And now he gets a good look. This is the moment for John. He wrote, remember this is, the, the other disciple is John. He's the one who penned this. He wrote that he believed. That word can be translated, he had faith. He saw it and he had faith. The missing body made Jesus' words finally click, and he had faith. Now, there's no way at this point he can put all the pieces together, but he had faith that his friend and his Lord was not in that tomb anymore, and he was alive. Now, there's three of them there. According to the law, it took two or three to establish a legal testimony. In that part of the world at that time, uh, they were very, very patriarchal. Uh, They would not have used Mary's testimony. It wouldn't be considered legal. Now, before you get frustrated, watch how God responds. Pay attention as this goes forward here in a minute. But but Mary, verse 11, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she said to him. And I don't know where they put him. Like like John, now Mary comes up, she bends over and glances in, but what Mary sees at this point ties all of Scripture together. She sees two angels. Woman, why are you crying? In, In my kind of weird mind, I hear him saying it at the exact same time. Why are you crying? There's an angel, Scripture's careful here, there's an angel at the head and an angel at the feet. Um, If you're familiar with your Old Testament, remember the Ark of the Covenant? Or if anybody remember the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, where it was about that. We have a picture of the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was the most holy object in their world. It was the presence of God Himself and a powerful reminder. See, inside of that reminder were His law that had been broken, His provision, and His anointing. All of that wrapped up in this box. And on this box, the top was layered in gold. They called it the mercy seat. So once a year, once a year, the high priest, like folks didn't dare go near this. It's the presence of God. You get careless there and you die. Once a year, they'd go in and they'd sprinkle blood on the top, on this mercy seat. Now, make sure you get the picture here so that this is the presence of God. When he looks at his broken law, he doesn't see the law. He sees the blood and satisfaction is made. When she looks in, 
And she sees the angel here and the angel here. What we're getting is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. We're getting a living picture of the mercy seat. All of that was about Jesus. All of that Old Testament sacrificial system, all of those rules and everything they did was to point to this moment because it's not the blood of any lamb that's going to save you and I from our choices. It's the blood of Jesus that does that. Look at verse 14. Having said this, and they said, why are you crying? She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why why are you crying? Who is it you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to the Father and your Father, or to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. Something very, very special is happening here. Something intentional, something divine. Peter and John were in that same tune, and they didn't see the angels. But Mary did. The world may not have valued Mary's testimony. But God did. He arranged this for her. And out of the darkness, Jesus speaks from behind her. She knew Jesus. She loved Jesus. But in the darkness and through her tears, she doesn't initially recognize who he is. Honestly, why would she? He's dead. Or so she thought. Why are you crying? And once again, she struggles to put the events together. And then with, with one word, darkness turned to dawn. Grieving turned to warmth. Everything changed with this. Mary. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. In the hardest moment of her life, Jesus called her by name. For Mary, there would never be another day this young. Not like this day. When life spoke her name. She responds with a a very distant, respectful uh, Rabboni. And I love that John helps those of us that don't speak Aramaic. He was like, yeah, okay, that means teacher. And I imagine that Mary's processor was hit and overload at this point. And eventually, she grabs a hold of him, and he says, hey, don't, don't cling to me. This moment is so incredibly important and so incredibly kind. I think of all the hurts that Mary must have had. She has experienced overwhelming trauma, rejection, and now an uncertain future. The fears have been devastating. And Jesus is spectacular here. He immediately reminds her that he's not leaving, but that he is ascending. And here's the deal. Jesus hasn't gone away because Jesus' work is just as much going on in heaven today as it was when he was here. He is reigning and he is interceding on behalf of his church. And he immediately includes her in what he's going to do. He's like, hey, I need for you to be my messenger. The world may not take your testimony, but it's important to me. She becomes the apostle to the apostles. Apostle just means the sent one. And she becomes the first one there. He hadn't abandoned her. And then he informs her of her new status, her, her truest identity. 
See, everything changed with his death, burial, and resurrection. Everything is different because Easter is true. And he says, here, get this. My father is your father. My God is your God. That means she's part of the family. She now has an identity, a standing that is greater than the wounds. Four chairs, four people, four perspectives on Easter. Mary, we'll, we'll, we'll start with her since we, she was most recent. This is the deep end of the pool. She brings her pain, don't miss this, she brings her pain to the pain of Jesus. She takes it to the tomb. Have you ever thought, those of you who've been around the church for a while and read your Bibles a bit, have you ever noticed how much of the New Testament is either about the suffering of Christ or the suffering of those who follow Him? Life is hard. Find a Christian that's been a Christian for a long time, and they're going to tell you it's not easy. We're not exempt to struggle. And if you're listening or buying into a theology that doesn't have a place for suffering, it is not a biblical theology. Throw it out. And Jesus doesn't throw cliches at her. I, I, I can tell you this. When I have been around um, suffering in funerals, I know that they are occasions for cliche and bad theology. We tend to want to throw verses out of context. We, we tend to just want to throw easy answers to that. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He doesn't, he doesn't give her the buck up, cowgirl, it's going to be okay. He doesn't promise that she can live her best life now. What he does do is infinitely more valuable. He speaks to her identity. And if you're in a place of hurt today, perhaps you need to hear this as well. Jesus says, I'm going to my Father, who's your Father. My God is your God. Consider the implications of that. Because Easter is true, those who, uh, um, who come to Christ now have a new family that includes Jesus himself. You've been adopted by faith. Jesus implies, and the rest of the New Testament confirms, that the relationship that he has with the Father is now ours to be had with the Father as well. It's a life of love. Jesus shares what is his. Think about this. The Father, God the Father, who says God is love, all of his love, the object of his love is Jesus the Son. When we come to him by faith, we get to be participants of that. We live in the overflow of his love. Through Christ, his affections are now pointed towards us. They are ours. And the expectation is, by the way, the expectation is that we'll share it as well but it's also a life filled with the presence of God. Think about it. Jesus always talking about, I don't do anything that the Father doesn't tell me. He's always with the Father. Now, the way that works now is, remember, he said, it's better that I go away so that the Holy Spirit will come and live in you and I. And we get to experience the highs and lows of life with God right with us, as a matter of fact, in us. Ultimately, Ultimately, this promise means that a resurrection is coming for you and I as well. I heard uh, someone ask uh, uh, a favorite theologian of mine, who said, hey, how's your health been? He said, there's nothing wrong with me that a good resurrection won't fix. <laughs> That's coming. You need more detail on that? 1 Corinthians 15. Mary. But then Peter. We have Peter run into the tomb honestly, so full of regrets. Let me tell you what, regrets are a burden that just wear you down. In a few days, a few days from this moment, Jesus will look Peter in the eyes, and he's going to call him to account, and he's going to confront him, 
and restore him. Peter, Peter will repent and go on to be one of the greatest leaders that the church will ever know. And this is important because there's so many of us here whose lives are filled with regret for the choices we've made. Easter is the occasion to run to Jesus. Don't ignore the problem. Don't blame someone else. Face it, repent, and receive freedom. Then get to work loving God and loving your neighbors. Around the world today, there are churches that are filled with folks who will only sit on the sideline because of regrets. There's freedom because of Easter. Own it. Embrace it. Or as my notes so eloquently say, don't be that guy. Easter screams that forgiveness wins, love wins. Our failures don't get to define us. I don't want to be defined by the worst choices that I've ever made. I want to be defined by the one choice that I made to follow Jesus. Easter gives us that. And then there's John. Honestly, it's hard to pick a bunch on John here because all he does is brag about outrunning Peter. <laughs> and the very next conversation between John and Jesus, Jesus is going to look him in the eye and say, you need to mind your business, John. Very comforting, I know. Or really, what's he say? Is it, what's it any of your business if I do this? John was a solid guy that had a few rough spots that Jesus would work out over time. John is that steady Eddie. He walked with Jesus the rest of his life. He went from a guy with anger issues to be known as the apostle of love and the author of five books of the New Testament. What he came to believe on Easter morning set him on a long obedience in the same direction. And perhaps your life doesn't have the excitement of, of Peter's or the grand story of Mary. Perhaps you believe and you've been trying to live that long uh, obedience in the same direction as patiently as you can and as Jesus is, is persistently working out the rough spots. Be encouraged today. Be encouraged today. What John came to believe is true, and Jesus is alive. And remember, it's John that down the road will point us to that last, that last Easter morning, a day that, honestly, I can scarcely even imagine. L listen to his words. This is Revelation 21. This is the final Easter. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth that passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for a husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne, by the way, that's Jesus, looks at, I'm making everything new. The word new here, let me, let me interject real quick. The new word new here doesn't mean something new that wasn't before. It means something that's take, been taken and fixed up better than new. Like I've got a 69 Mustang that's just like new. I don't have a Mustang, but I'm making a point. <laughs> he also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I give freely to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. Easter says that's true. Because he lives, we can trust what he has to say. And then there's Jesus. The Alpha, the Omega, who is alive and faithful and true. He's always pushing forward, always sitting with his hurting family, reminding them of who they really are in him. 
and the hope that they have because Easter is true, always challenging us to, to continue to turn closer to Him and to repent from that stuff that, honestly, we know sits in our lives and doesn't have any business being there. Always pointing us to the hope we have in Easter. And always worthy of everything that we have. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Let's pray. Lord, you are spectacular in ways we cannot comprehend. I thank you so much for the veracity of your word in the way that it reminds us and takes us to that, that first Easter morning. And I thank you even more because what it says is true. And you are alive. And because you are alive, I have hope today. And we have hope today. We have a new identity today. We have a new family. All because you're awesome. And because you live. God, would you... Would you remind us tomorrow and the next day and the next day of the truth of Easter? And we pray that now as we sing, we might make you smile. All because you loved us and all because your son lives. Amen.